ladies and gentlemen, one of the guests invited to the conference was the vice president. He unfortunately could not be with us, but he has written me the following letter. And here's big. I would like to think I played a small part in inspiring this event when I addressed the Federalist Society last January on the struggle between the executive and legislative branches over the conduct of our foreign policy. The Iran-Contra affair, the events in the Persian Gulf, and the debate over the interpretation of the ABM Treaty all underscore the timeliness and importance of your discussions. The impressive lineup of panels and speakers for the conference shows that you have brought together some of the nation's best minds to conduct a balanced examination of these important issues. I hope that the conference will address some of the reasons for our current situation, as well as concrete proposals for structural change. I look forward to hearing back from you soon on any conclusions you reach. Once again, I wish you success with this most important endeavor. Sincerely, George Bush. Let me now not only welcome all of you to this undertaking, but particularly salute the distinguished moderators and panelists and guests in the audience. I look forward particularly to the discussion that will follow the formal presentations. A successful symposium requires not only the presentation of contending views, but also an interaction of these perspectives. It is from a creative exchange of views that we all benefit the most. I'm therefore very pleased to chair the symposium assembled by the Federalist Society, particularly because it deals with the most timely and important topic, foreign affairs and the Constitution. Who makes national security policy is not an idle question for academic debate. How we answer that question in practice determines the American capacity to act in the world. That in turn affects not only our ability to ensure the survival and security of the United States, but also our capacity to affect the future course of world events. A number of constitutional questions have direct relevance to the manner in which the United States shapes its foreign policy. Our panels will address several of them. Today we will look first at the issue of the power to use military force and second, the relationship between the First Amendment and national security. Tomorrow, we'll take up first the issue of the treaty-making powers and then that of the powers inherent in the executive. We'll finally close the symposium with a panel on the virtues and vices of the democratic form of government in the formulation and conduct of foreign policy. The subject of the symposium is especially timely, given the current tensions between the executive and legislative and among contending factions within the Congress itself over the American role in the Persian Gulf. This debate highlights what I see as the political dimension in the constitutional struggle over foreign policy. Without prejudging the conclusions that our panels will arrive on the specific aspects of the subject, I'd like to address today a few remarks to the political dimension, for I believe it to be central to any reasonable management of the executive legislative relationship. Let me repeat that I intend to focus on the political, not the legal or constitutional aspects. I intend to address the political context of the dilemma. I think we have to recognize here two very obvious facts as a point of departure. First, in the last 15 years, the balance in that movable, dynamic, legislative, executive relationship has clearly shifted from the executive branch to the legislative. Congress has become more active, more involved, perhaps even more central 
in the shaping of national security policy. This has resulted from a variety of factors, but it is certainly a fact of life. Second, we have to recognize that an inherent ambiguity exists in the Constitution regarding the proper boundaries of the prerogatives of the legislative and the executive. Quite simply, the Constitution does not hand down clear-cut guidelines for the process of shaping national security policy. It gives neither the legislative nor the executive branch exclusive powers in this area. These powers are not separated but blended between the two branches. The president has the specific powers accorded to him, such as the treaty-making power. All the powers inherent in national sovereignty not explicitly given to the Congress, and those implied by his role as commander-in-chief. But the Congress has the power to declare war and the Senate to ratify or reject treaties. The legislative branch also has the decisive role in the budgetary process, and that clearly affects national security policy. All of this means that the relationship between the executive and the legislative is inevitably a fluid one. Determinant power will shift in one direction and then another, depending on the prevailing political circumstances. This fluid accommodation is a part of our constitutional tradition and as such, quite normal. But in recent years, our flexible arrangements have become less manageable, more polarized, even gridlocked. Today, I'd like to comment briefly on the causes, as I see them, of some of our current difficulties. The first is the collapse of bipartisanship. The delicate, informal, flexible relationship between the executive and the legislative in foreign affairs operates differently in the context of bipartisanship than in the context of partisanship. The United States has been engaged in the world as a major power for 40 years. And for roughly the first 20, we shaped our foreign policy by and large on the basis of bipartisanship. That inevitably affected the nature of the executive legislative relationship. It made for greater mutual trust. It made for a more automatic, though informal, process of consultations. Bipartisan consensus also meant that both branches shared certain common assumptions. I emphasize the word assumptions because a great deal of our foreign policy operates on automatically shared assumptions rather than deliberately framed strategy. We do not have in this country a tradition of shaping a geostrategic approach to foreign policy, but rather one of responding to certain basic commonly shared feelings. There's no doubt that our Anglophile feelings, for example, had a lot to do with the emergence of the Anglo-American alliance in World War II and the special relationship between the United States and Great Britain after the war. That then was extended into the communion that we undertook with Europe. But after 20 years, bipartisanship collapsed in the course of the Vietnamese War. Today, alternative partisan conceptions color a great deal of the dialogue on foreign policy issues. These conceptions are based on increasingly different assumptions about the world, about American values, about the uses of power, about the nature of the threat, and about American priorities. A partisan approach to foreign policy inevitably affects the executive-legislative relationship, especially if one party controls the Congress and the other holds the White House. When there's a partisan split between these branches of government, 
policy differences inevitably intensify, further complicating the process of making sound policy. It subjects foreign policy to partisan debate and maneuvering and encourages the legislative branch to counterpose itself to the executive branch on the nature of strategic issues. The second problem, which has compounded executive legislative tensions over foreign policy, is our national tendency to confuse strategy with tactics. As I noted, we do not have a strategic tradition in this country. We do not have a tradition of articulating explicitly a set of strategic assumptions that clearly define our priorities. We often fail to distinguish central strategic fronts from peripheral fronts in our conflict with the Soviets. We tend to be driven towards a policy-making process in which tactical considerations become dominant. As a result, tactics tend to shape the substance of strategy. For example, consider a current issue much in the forefront of public attention, the Iran-Contra debate. The problem would not have become acute if there had been a deeper awareness of the strategic issues involved. Such an awareness would not have allowed the issue of the hostages in Lebanon to become paramount. It would have also facilitated a greater discrimination in the choice of tactics designed to serve the strategic objective of renewing the American-Iranian relationship. But the preoccupation with tactics became so strong, and the choice of tactics in the end so bizarre, that the ultimate strategic objective of the enterprise was overshadowed and finally negated. In the context of the collapse of bipartisanship, this second problem has become intertwined with the executive legislative debate. The United States simply has not cultivated a process and exercise of devising and articulating a national strategy, revising it periodically, and then adapting tactics to serve it. The confluence of these problems has led to the legislating of tactics rather than to the debating of strategy. The executive branch, which is prey to the same preoccupation with tactics, often compounds the problem by emphasizing tactics without thinking seriously about strategic assumptions. The third problem is the still inadequate and insufficiently serious consultation between the executive and legislative branches regarding strategic matters. Presidents have tended not to engage their colleagues in Congress on this issue, and the executive branch does not even have adequately developed mechanisms to do so. The National Security Council could serve as a vehicle to promote a dialogue on strategy. One of the NSC's proper roles is to serve as an advisor to the president on the development of a strategic approach to the world and to coordinate the actions of the different executive departments, the State Department, the Defense Department, and the intelligence communities. That is how the National Security Advisor should see his role. Yet he is unable to appear before Congress to explain his efforts or his assumptions. If he does so informally, he's often viewed by those in the traditional departments, such as state, as usurping their legitimate role. That in turn further inhibits a process of promoting a dialogue on strategy. I know from my own experience that whenever I appeared on Capitol Hill to meet with senators or congressmen, I could only do so informally, literally under quasi-surreptitious circumstances. That was almost inevitably followed by recriminations from the Department of State on the grounds that this was usurping its role. Yet at the same time, the fact is that the Department of State does not and cannot shape national security policy. It too often confuses diplomacy with foreign policy. It forgets that diplomacy is only one aspect of foreign policy. 
military power, intelligence, covert activity, financial power, and threat assessment are also all part of the process of making a national security policy. Diplomacy is but one component of such policy. The fourth problem that falls into today's tensions between the executive and the legislative branches is the nature of modern warfare and the nature of the threat to our national survival. These have altered some dimensions of executive decision making. I have particularly in mind here the fact that modern circumstances have compressed the time available for critical decision making under circumstances of the most dire threat. We live in an age in which we're always faced with the potential danger, I repeat potential, of having to make critical life and death decisions under the most incredible of pressures. This inevitably complicates the constitutional responsibilities of the executive branch vis-a-vis -vis the legislative branch. The fact is that in the event of a nuclear conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, the president would have roughly four minutes in which to make the most difficult and most critical decisions. If the Soviet Union initiated a nuclear strike at night, the national security advisor would have to wake up the president roughly three minutes after the launch of the Soviet missiles. The president would then have to consult with the national security advisor and roughly from the fourth to the eighth minute review certain rather complex procedures. He would have to engage in a rather critical process of decision making with some other key individuals. He would then have to choose among several options and undertake certain decisions whose execution would have to be initiated roughly from the eighth to the tenth minute. Clearly, these procedures require literally a few individuals to assume an enormous amount of responsibility. It is a question of enormous sensitivity and clearly of utmost national importance. It obviously affects how we operate as a nation and how we make policy under the most dire of circumstances. Yet it cannot be governed by the conventional constitutional guidelines for the declaration and conduct of war. Given the compression of time for decision making, there would be an unavoidable collision between constitutional provisions and actual real life situations. Here, concentration of command and control authority in the hands of a single person has to be ensured under all circumstances to prevent political decapitation. Without that, our ability to initiate a retaliatory strike and therefore the credibility of our deterrent threat would come into question. The Carter administration was the first in some 20 years to exercise these complex crisis procedures. The executive branch, particularly the president, has to be both versed in and prepared for these critical procedures. There is no time to learn them in the event of a real crisis. The survivability of our government under the circumstances of modern warfare requires attention to this matter, not only for the purpose of war fighting, should that become necessary, but primarily for that of deterrence. In this regard, it seems inevitable that Congress must delegate authority to the president. The fifth problem, complicating executive legislative relations, involves covert action. Today, there are widely divergent perceptions about the role of covert activity in our national security policy. Few dispute that there is a need from time to time for some covert activity. It is a legitimate form of international action designed to obtain desired political objectives. It can involve support for foreign trade unions, counteracting disinformation in the foreign press, influencing key foreign decision makers, or exercising other forms of suasion.
Some of these actions are relatively harmless and risk-free, while others carry serious consequences and involve great risks to the individuals concerned in undertaking them. Can such activities be undertaken without consultation with the legislative branch? I believe that the answer is clearly no. Some consultations are necessary. But if there is such consultation, can it be achieved with the security needed for the operation to succeed? Unfortunately, my own experience in the White House, but also recent experience more generally, indicates that the chances for success in that context are not quite certain. Both the executive and the legislative oversight bodies must make certain that leaks will not compromise the policy, thereby placing into jeopardy not only the objectives of the operation, but also the safety of individuals engaged in these potentially hazardous actions. Moreover, any leak destroys the needed mutual confidence between the legislative and executive branches, thereby complicating the ability of individuals of goodwill on both sides to undertake the needed cooperation for integrating covert action into our overall national security policy. All of these problems are, in a sense, crystallized in the War Powers Act. It represents the outcome of a profound struggle over the proper lines of authority for the exercise of military force by the United States. After the end of the American involvement in the Vietnamese War, there was a pervasive fear in the Congress that the executive had overstepped its constitutional authority during that conflict. That was the political context in which the resolution was passed. Since then, no president has invoked its procedures or has even conceded the constitutionality of its provisions. I believe the issues it raises are genuine political problems that need to be addressed. But the War Powers Act itself may not have been a proper response to those issues and may not now provide proper answers to the real dilemmas we face and which I have tried to outline. In a recent speech on the War Powers Act, a former top congressional leader recalled that, and I quote, as that legislation went to the House of Representatives, the Senate, and was handed down to the president, I took exactly the same position as a member of Congress on this issue as I took while in the White House." End of quote. President Ford, who before becoming president had served as House Minority Leader for many years, goes on to say, and I quote again, I believe that the War Powers Resolution is unconstitutional. Secondly, it is impractical. And thirdly, it constrains the president's effort in trying to achieve or maintain peace." End of quote. These are rather harsh condemnations of a piece of legislation that is still on the books. In making the case for its unconstitutionality, President Ford stresses a key requirement for the War Powers Resolution, the fact that after 60 days, if the Congress has simply not approved the president's action, I repeat, if the Congress has simply not approved the president's actions, all troops must be withdrawn from hostilities. President Ford adds, I quote, if the Congress is mired in indecision or in inaction or lacks courage or guts, if you want to call it that, to do anything, it can do nothing and achieve the same result as if they had ordered it by majority vote in both the House and the Senate." End of quote. President Ford then goes on to cite some constitutional precedents that suggest this kind of legislation is in fact unconstitutional. I leave it to the lawyers to resolve the constitutional legalities. But I find it rather revealing that a former major congressional leader who briefly served as the President of the United States takes such a strong position on the subject.
He also argues that the War Powers Act is an impractical law by requiring consultations under circumstances in which these are impossible sometimes. President Ford recounts that in dealing with certain crises, he literally could not locate the immediate persons with whom, under the War Powers Act, he had to consult before he could act. The problems connected with the War Powers Act have been particularly evident in the continuing debate over the American role in the Persian Gulf. Many in Congress want President Reagan to invoke the provisions of the War Powers Act. There have even been fitful movements to force him to do so. Yet at the same time, it is clear that Congress has no consensus about our policy objectives or our tactical requirements. Congress has debated literally for months, for months, about the proper role for US military forces in the Persian Gulf. There is a general consensus that the United States has interests in the Gulf that need to be protected. But beyond that, Congress cannot agree about the specific form that our role should take. Are our forces simply on a symbolic mission to show the flag? Should we require cooperation from Arab friends in the Gulf before putting our forces there? Should we protect the reflagged tankers? Should we protect our Arab friends from Iranian attacks? Should we retaliate in the event of Iranian attacks on our forces? If so, what should be the character of the retaliation? Congress will not give the president a blank check in the Gulf, but Congress cannot formulate legislative language to cope with the myriad and rapidly changing contingencies involved in our action. In brief, Congress cannot act as if it were the commander in chief. I mention this to highlight the fact that over the last 15 years, a pattern in executive legislative relations has developed, which does create serious difficulties. These cannot, in my judgment, be finally resolved by legislation or formal arrangements. Repealing the War Powers Act would not solve the problem in spite of everything that I have said about it. Alone, that would not automatically restore a proper balance. The difficulty arises not from a deficiency in the statutes. It is instead, as I have argued, a political problem. What is needed is a process of political accommodation and adjustment that takes into account the global circumstances of the United States and the political and constitutional realities at home. It is with this in mind that in conclusion, I would now like to share five suggestions that might be helpful in dealing with these problems. I would like to note that I said in dealing with and not resolving these problems. We are faced not with a puzzle that can be solved given enough ingenuity but with a condition inherent in the complexity of our constitutional arrangement. The first suggestion involves a deliberate quest for a greater degree of bipartisanship, but a deliberate quest for the sake of a better executive legislative relationship in the area of national security policy. It is important and desirable that a more deliberate effort be made particularly by the president, to move the country back towards some genuine degree of bipartisanship. Now, this is not a pious wish, and it is not a prayer. Bipartisanship does not happen by itself. It is not a gift from the gods. It is a relationship that is accomplished through patient, deliberate work. I believe that President Reagan has missed a very major opportunity to move in that direction. When he came into office, he had a unique broad mandate, particularly in national security policy. His was a special unprecedented opportunity in the post-Vietnam period. He was the first president to my knowledge who, as a member of his, who had as a member of his transition team, a former presidential candidate of the opposite party working on the issue of national security. If the president had appointed Senator Jackson as Secretary of Defense, 
he would have taken a giant step towards achieving bipartisanship. And I say this with no reflection implied on one of our subsequent speakers. That is the way it was done under President Truman and President Eisenhower. They shared power with responsible members of the opposite party with whom a certain degree of shared consensus existed. I would like to stress that these things have to be done deliberately. I often urged President Carter to work more closely with Senator Howard Baker, and they both tried. But in my judgment, our administration did not try hard enough. We did not go the last mile in this regard. We made no effort to draw members of the opposite party into our administration. The first step must be taken by the executive branch, and then the legislative branch must respond. Future administrations must make a truly serious effort to enhance bipartisanship in order to deal with the political problems inherent in the executive legislative relationship in foreign affairs. The second suggestion involves a more deliberate formulation of national strategy. We need a strategic process. We need a method for developing a more coherent approach to our national security, one that respects the needed distinction between strategy and tactics. It must also involve joint participation of the executive and legislative branches. We can no longer shape national strategy or deal with strategic questions simply by relying on the decisions of a president, his national security advisor, and his secretaries of state and defense. We're no longer living in an age, as we were in World War II, when foreign policy was the exclusive prerogative of the executive branch. Ad hoc consultations are not enough. What is needed is a process of consultation. I believe that it would be desirable for the president to use the National Security Council meetings on a roughly monthly basis for enlarged consultations with the top congressional leadership regarding strategic matters. These would not be decision-making meetings, thus maintaining the distinction between the executive and the legislative branches. But it would be a way to engage congressional leaders in the process, and the overall national security policy-making process needs their input and involvement. In these meetings, the president and congressional leaders would take up a discussion of our national strategic objectives. Our leadership could define our goals, identify priorities, distinguish between central and peripheral issues, and shape the guidelines for the exercise of our power and diplomacy. Such meetings could begin to close the pernicious gap between the two branches of our government and could help to establish more generally a sense of shared direction. The third suggestion involves the appointment of former congressional figures to top-level executive slots in the area of national security policy. I think it would be useful for our presidents to look at this possibility more closely. I do not think it should become an established practice, nor should it become a pervasive practice. But I do think that it would be helpful if one of the three principal presidential advisors, the Secretary of State or the Secretary of Defense or the National Security Advisor, were a well-respected and well-informed former senior congressman or senior senator who shares the president's strategic perspectives. Such an appointee would become a distinct informal link with the Congress. Something along these lines is absolutely essential if we are going to redress current executive legislative tensions and particularly the present trend towards micromanagement of foreign policy among 535 putative secretaries of state and or defense. The fourth suggestion is that we consider the possibility of having the National Security Advisor make regular but informal appearances before pertinent congressional committees. Over the years, there have been only two kinds of National Security Advisors, those who play a useful role and those who are irrelevant. But if the individual plays the role he should be playing, he should be accessible on a limited, informal, but regular basis to the Congress in order to help shape the needed executive legislative consensus. The fact is that the Secretary of State cannot truly articulate national security strategy because his department cannot produce it for him. His department is essentially preoccupied with negotiations. It has excellent people for that objective, 
The same is true with the different expertise about the Department of Defense. There needs to be someone who works closely with the president, who shares the president's strategic policy and bureaucratic perspectives, and who has legitimate authority to speak on behalf of the president with an overall strategic view and to share it informally with the congressional leadership. My final suggestion is that it would also help if we had a single joint intelligence committee in the Congress. I think that the existence of two committees with two staffs creates some of the difficulties that we have experienced. Under the present system, the fact is that too many people are involved. That makes a shambles of any effort to conduct responsible, serious consultations. I believe that a single committee with strictly defined rules of procedure, both for its staff and its members, would help a great deal to infuse mutual confidence and mutual trust. That, in turn, would make the intelligence agencies of the executive branch much more confident in fully consulting and sharing its views, aspirations, and problems with the legislative branch, as certainly should be the case. This critique and these suggestions certainly will not resolve the problem inherent in the executive legislative relationship in the area of national security. No comprehensive solution is possible because the problem is inherent in our constitutional structure. But steps in the directions I've indicated might help to fashion a more favorable political context for executive legislative decision making an approach that would be better designed to mobilize public support for our foreign policy and to generate greater strategic consistency in foreign policy. None of my suggestions is designed to establish the supremacy of one branch over the other. Rather, they reflect the recognition, based both on study and on very direct personal experience, that in our system neither side has ultimate supremacy and that efforts to achieve supremacy by either side would be counterproductive to the US national security policy making process. Our political system works well only when guided by the spirit of compromise. The quest for unilateral domination can only produce enmity or gridlock. I offer these views in the conviction that a cooperative balance is not only clearly desirable, but is, in fact, politically feasible. And the point of departure for a remedy to our current dilemmas is, in fact, in the realm of politics. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the next item on our agenda, which is almost 10 minutes behind schedule now, and that's my fault and I apologize, is the very important panel on the President's power as Commander-in-Chief versus Congress's war power and appropriation powers. And uh, Council Culverhouse will chair and he will introduce the panelists. So let me invite the panel to the podium for the continuation of our program.